I'm going to move on now to um, Sarah Blenis. I hope I've pronounced your name right, Sarah. P apologies if I haven't. Um, so Sarah's a uh, project manager of the Hammond River Angling Association. Um, and I've been doing some really interesting work on cyan cyanobacteria, which is becoming a, a real issue for, I know, for many of us. And as cyanobacteria becomes more and more common, many watershed groups are looking for ways to better track or predict blooms. Um, Hammond River Angling Association have deployed algae trackers in their watershed, monitoring key parameters that are associated with cyanobacteria blooms in real time. So Sarah's going to talk to us now about how her team have been able to predict and react to cyanobacteria blooms using this uh, novel technology. So over to you, Sarah. And as I said with the others, I'll just give you a nudge when there's two minutes uh, uh, up before you're at the end of your talk. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to the Atlantic Water Network for having me on as a presenter today. And awesome job to both Mary and Gavin. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the rest of the presentations over the next couple of days. Um, so have you, have you, uh, as you have mentioned, my name is Sarah Blinas uh, from the Hammond River Angling Association. And our presentation will focus on a new piece of uh, equipment that we have been able to use to increase our understanding of cyanobacteria within the Hammond River watershed. Um, how do I go next? Right there. So back in 2021, one of the lakes within our watershed experienced a cyanobacteria bloom. Uh, this is Starlings Lake. It is about two and a half kilometers long by one and a half kilometers wide with a maximum depth of 10 meters. So this is the second largest lake within our watershed. Um, and in 2021, about 95% of the lake experienced a very large scale cyanobacteria bloom. Uh, the HRAA has been around since 1977 or for 47 years. This was the first time uh, that we have experienced a cyanobacteria bloom within the watershed. Oops. So that left us with a lot of questions in 2021 about what were we going to do, uh, especially where we had no historical data to get us started off. At the time in 2021, we had limited resources for water quality testing. Um, we did have access to a turbidity meter and we were borrowing a YSI through the Atlantic Water Network's equipment data bank. Um, and through our partnership with ACAP St. John, we were able to get some uh, rapid test kits. Um, also at the time in 2021, our provincial lab did not have the ability to process any cyanobacteria related water quality samples in house. They all had to be outsourced outside of New Brunswick, which further exasperated the situation. So moving into 2022, we really recognized that we needed to expand our monitoring strategy. Blooms can be really unpredictable and we weren't sure at the time if this would continue on in 2022, but we wanted to be prepared just in case it did. So we did an immense amount of research back in 2021, looking for ways that we could bolster our monitoring strategy just so we could be prepared for 2022. And I'm sure a lot of the um, nonprofit organizations also can empathize with how difficult it can be to secure the necessary funding to get capital item purchases for equipment. And most of the things available at that time were way outside of our price point. Um, fortunately, in 2021, we did come across a new startup company based in Ohio called Aqua Real Time. Um, in 2021, actually, they also received a very large financial backing from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to kind of get them up and running. Um, they were promoting a, a device that was doing real-time monitoring, uh, easy installation. You could be notified before Blooms, pretty much checking off all of the boxes that we were looking for as an organization to help us with our cyanobacteria monitoring. We reached out to them and their support network is absolutely fantastic. And we realized that their equipment was well within the range of what we could do and the finances that we had available on hand. So just, just to pause for a quick second, HRA is not an affiliate of Aqua Real Time, nor do we get any kind of bonus for like promoting these. Just we're so excited 
to have found something that worked for us that we're hoping that we can maybe encourage others to get this. So just a disclaimer there. So this is an algae tracker. Um, now here, at least in New Brunswick, we're trying to change the way we communicate about cyanobacteria. We're trying to move the conversation more towards bacteria and not algae. This is an American product, so we're still at algae tracker. And for the purpose of this presentation, we're gonna keep calling it its real name as algae tracker that way. If you wanna Google it later, you can. So on the device, it's got a solar panel on the top with a built-in battery. Um, it can stay charged for up to three days without sunlight. Um, on the bottom is its sensor. I think you can see that sensor and anti-biofouling brush. Um, it's also got a built-in GPS tracking unit. So it can be packed from its anchor and starts to float away. Or if a curious member of the public decides to take it home, you can literally track your device down and get it back, which is pretty awesome. Uh, they need to be deployed in water that is at least three meters deep and needs to be in an area that has cell phone service in order for it to be able to transmit the data up into the cloud. Um, we've been attaching ours with a 20 pound anchor and a marine grade cord. Um, if you're in an area that is prone to more wave action or wakes from boats, uh, the company does make, you can see in the picture here, more of a stabilizing buoy. That's not something that we require for Darlings Lake, but it might be something you might want to consider based on the lake that you're looking at. So every 30 minutes, these algae trackers collect data and transmit it to the uh, cloud and the online dashboard. So some of the parameters it's collecting are air temperature, water temperature, turbidity, chlorophyll A, phycocyanin, and ambient light. The unit also pairs with it, the nearest weather station and is collecting precipitation data as well as wind speed. So before we get into the dashboard, I just wanna quickly go through some of these parameters and why they're important for cyanobacteria monitoring. Because if you're like us, some of these were kind of really, really new that we had never done um, as part of our water quality monitoring in the past. So first up we have weather. Um, cyanobacteria is photosynthetic, so it does need sunlight. Um, there's also a positive correlation between sunlight and water temperature. Uh, cyanobacteria typically thrives when the water temperature is between 20 and 30 degrees. Um, and precipitation plays a huge part as well in bloom formation. When you have a heavy rainfall event, it can uh, um, increase the influx of nutrients into the water body. Um, yeah, so that's weather and it tracks all of these. Uh, turbidity is something that most watershed groups are fairly familiar with. It measures how cloudy or clear your water is um, and it can indicate excess nutrients or suspended solids in the water. But from a cyanobacteria perspective, if you notice that your turbidity trends are starting to increase and there hasn't been any major rainfall events to encourage that increase in turbidity, chances are it could be a bloom that is starting to form because the bloom in the water will also increase your turbidity levels. Next up is chlorophyll A. Now this is something that HRAA has never sampled for before. This was an entirely new parameter for our freshwater water quality monitoring. Um, chlorophyll A is photosynthetic green pigment. It is present in cyanobacteria, but it's also present in all plant life, including aquatic plants and eukaryotic algae. Lots of different lakes are full of many different types of algae. So while this is really important and is a part of cyanobacteria, it also can pick up, if you're monitoring specifically for chlorophyll A, it could be picking up other types of algae that are not cyanobacteria, which is why it's really important to monitor chlorophyll A in tandem with phycocyanin. Again, this is another new parameter that we had never been documenting before in our water quality monitoring. Uh, phycocyanin is another uh, photosynthetic pigment, uh, but this one is blue. So it's interesting to think the chlorophyll A, that's your green, and the phycocyanin is your blue. So that phrase blue-green algae, that's kind of where it's coming from. You need the combination of the two. Chlorophyll A can be in like I said, all plants, aquatic plants and algae, but phycocyanin is spe 
specific to cyanobacteria. That's why it's really, really important to measure both of those together at the same time. And this was something totally new for the HRIA to be looking at and including in our water quality monitoring. So this is kind of a look at what the online dashboard looks like. I just wanna point out, I've been taking these pictures on Monday, like screenshots of what the dashboard looks like. Even though our devices are no longer in the water, it is still uploading our nearest weather station data. Um, so you can see a Google Earth image of where the tracker was back in July. Um, then you have all of our weather data, which is still uploading as for this week. So on Friday, we are expecting snow. So just keep that in mind when we move into the next slide that air temperature and weather data is current, even though I'm showing you stuff from July. So further down on the dashboard, for the six main parameters that you, you'll be tracking, um, they have programmable alerts, which is really, really fascinating. So, um, and again, air temperature at minus one, just ignore that, that is current for Monday, not representative of the rest of them that were taken back in July. So each water body will be different. What I've set as threshold alerts for Darling's Lake might be different for other lakes. So what we noticed was that our blooms would form when phycocyanin levels were over 50 RFU. And you can see that we're now into the red. Uh, we've set an alert threshold limit for chlorophyll A um, to be 150 and we're getting closer to that 150. So it's in the orange right now. And again, same with turbidity um, where our threshold level was set at 50. So once you've reached that threshold limit that you've personalized into your unit, it will send an alert to either your phone or to your email to let you know that you're getting there and that you might wanna make sure that you have your water bottles ready, your staff is ready, and to kind of give you an indication, an early indication that things are happening in your water body and to get ready. All right, so the unit also keeps a continuous tracking of the phycocyanin and the chlorophyll A. So on the bottom chart here, you can see what it looked like um, July 6th to July 10th. Nothing really going on. We also confirmed that visually. Then we could start to see later on in July that we were having some movement between our phycocyanin and our chlorophyll A. By July 19th, we had reached, we had alerts from our threshold limits. We were ready. We understood that a bloom was about to happen. And by July 20th, you can kind of see us on the dock there. We had our equipment ready. We had a drone ready. We were there right on time to say, yep, and the bloom has really bloomed. That night, uh, we had a really heavy rainfall event, which you can see on the bottom spike where the trend went down. Uh, the bloom didn't disappear or get washed out. It just moved down in the water column. There we go. So throughout July, we had uh, quite, quite a massive bloom going on. And this really helped us to be able to know when to send out our team to go investigate. Uh, we're kind of lucky in a way here where our office is only about five minutes away from Darling's Lake, but other groups that might be like 45 minutes to an hour away from a lake that's being impacted by a cyan cyanobacteria bloom, having this ability to say, this is when I should send my team. I need to make sure that I have X, Y, and Z all lined up is a huge time saver and can help save a lot of money for your organization too in travel costs. We also noticed something really peculiar happened in August. We had a ton of activity in phycocyanin and chlorophyll. And then on August um, 16th, it just dropped right off, but we didn't have a heavy rainfall event for that time. So we were able to go out because we weren't really sure what was going on at that point that caused such a dramatic drop. Again, this helped give us the indication of when we should be putting boots on the ground, go out and look. Um, and what we found, this was the first time that we had documented this, was the cyanobacteria turnover phase. This is when older cyanobacteria cells are dying and while new ones are being replaced, uh, the cell walls rupture, which tends to allow the cellular contents to leak into the surrounding environments particularly um, phycocyanin. So we had this really thick blue scum on top of the waters. And usually once you have a turnover phase, 
the, um, the cells will leach out the cyanotoxins. So this is also an excellent time to be running your rapid test kits if you have those rapid test kits available or to be collecting a water sample for lab analysis. Uh, the dashboard also allows customizable charts, uh, which is pretty awesome. All of this data that is on the dashboard, you can download into an Excel file um, and then manipulate your graphs and charts as you see fit. But it is amazing to have something that does the chart work for you. You can also choose um, different parameters to compare against each other. So if you wanted to see chlorophyll A and your water temperature for a specific set of time, say Ju July 1st to July 5th, you just plug those in. It's kind of plug and play. And right here, you can really see the positive correlation between phycocyanin, chlorophyll, and turbidity during a bloom and how all of those three are really working together. Just got less, just a bit less than two minutes, Sarah. Ooh, okay. <laughs> okay, we're going to go really fast now. Mm -hmm. So in 2023, we were fortunate enough to get, uh, secure some funding. We were able to partner with uh, the Gemsag Watershed Alliance, uh, Belial Watershed Coalition, and ACAP St. John. We put a bunch of these out throughout the lower uh, Wolfstoke St. John River. Um, this is kind of an overview of what all of the dashboard looks like. This really helped to be able to increase our communication between the watershed groups, where I could call Belial and say, hey, just to let you know, some of your trends are looking a little high. You might want to be prepared in the next couple of days to deploy your staff. Um, this is also compatible with data stream, which I know a lot of us use, um, which makes analysis really, really easy too. Um, and something else that's kind of cool that we've been working on, uh, there's a research group through Meridian and uh, Dalhousie University who are working on a satellite technology program to help with early bloom detection. So we provided them with access to all of our tracker data. So that way we have stuff happening in the sky and on the ground to help build along a better monitoring program. Cost, this is the big one. So the trackers cost about uh, $1,200 per unit that is in Canadian, including shipping and duty fees. Uh, the software is $2,450, um, that's annually. Um, there is a maintenance package. This is something that we have gotten for the past two years. It's kind of like an insurance policy. If anything wrong happens with your unit, someone drives over it with a boat, you just send it back. They immediately ship you out a brand new unit. That way there's as minimal delay as possible. And then they also offer the ruggedized package that has the larger buoy um, as well as anchor chain and all of that. We were able to get most of that for about $50. When we looked at standard um, like YSI probes that had chlorophyll and phycocyanin to rent, um, it cost uh, about $5,300. And that's just to rent the equipment temporarily. And then you have to give it back which um, is an ideal. It's nice to own the equipment and then you're paying an annual software. Um, additionally, with using like the other probes, you still have to send staff out and there's no way that you could do the same level of sending a staff out with a probe every 30 minutes, 24 seven for like five or six months of your sampling period. That just, it would not be feasible um, unless you had some amazing staff and volunteers to try to get that done. And then our goals for this upcoming year, we want to continue to expand the partnerships that we've created. This has had a really positive impact for the other five groups that we've been able to provide these trackers for. We created a collaborative funding proposal. Um, we would really like to keep that momentum going. I think it would be amazing to see something like this incorporated into the Atlantic Water Network's um, equipment hub. Um, that way, if an area is experiencing a cyanobacteria bloom and perhaps you don't have those finances readily available, because you never know when a bloom is going to happen. So it's really hard to um, anticipate when you should have that funding ready. Um, so it'd be great to create a collaborative part partnership to help get this into AWN's equipment bank. And we also want to keep working on getting all of this algae tracker data into the public domain, either through uh, data stream or using Aqua Real Times dashboard as well. And thank you. <laughs> and I look forward to the breakout room. <laughs> mm -hmm.